Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu everyone uh, first and foremost thank you all for joining we might have more people joining the discussion inshallah as we go along but we want to try and keep it uh, short and concise tonight um, so first and foremost Allah bless you all for joining this discussion tonight um, just a small introduction before we begin inshallah um, we have come together uh, on a weekly basis inshallah we plan to talk and to discuss and to share topics relating uh, to the ummah and the challenges that the ummah are facing through various topics some of them may be controversial but they are pertinent issues inshallah that we can exchange ideas that we can share and most importantly we can learn uh, and how to be more successful in our societies and also understand uh, the challenges around us before we start just a few things to mention inshallah that this uh, session is a recorded session inshallah ta'ala we have a podcast called Allah Knows Best. It is a podcast, inshallah, that is going to be on a weekly basis. And everyone is welcome to share and input their ideas in uh, from the panel of speakers that we have tonight, which we will be introducing them soon, to every single one of you. Um, so the format is, obviously, once we have the first few words from the panel, inshallah, everyone is welcome to raise their hand by clicking, I think it's the bottom right-hand corner, the hand button to raise your hand will invite you on the stage to say uh, your piece inshallah ta'ala and uh, to gain a better understanding uh, just a quick few house rules inshallah remember first and foremost we have created this platform as an open space for people to air their thoughts to share inshallah uh, but just be mindful of the topic we want to be uh, uh, focused on the topic at hand each week and uh, if you can try and keep your comments uh, short to a minimum, you can ask questions in the chat as well um, as we go along uh, to the panel of speakers. And also um, you can post your questions to the shayukh, to the experts, inshallah, as, uh, as well also. Just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Sami. I am going to be the host for tonight in this clubhouse, Allah Knows Best. If you all can be members of this room, inshallah, that we are able to come together every week to discuss issues, inshallah, uh, important issues pertaining to uh, the daily challenges that we face, inshallah ta'ala. The topic at hand tonight is the first pilot episode, alhamdulillah. It is episode one. And the topic at hand that we're going to be discussing tonight is the Muslims and anti-Islamic media, the anti-Islamic propagation um, and navigating uh, through this and how to deal with these issues, inshallah. Um, we're going to get both sides, inshallah, we're going to listen to both sides of the debate tonight, the discussion, bi'idhnillah. And also we are going to be touching on the issue tonight regarding our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Palestine. We know it's a very sensitive topic, inshallah, so we're going to just give a brief general um, uh, uh, outline of the issues highlighted, inshallah, regarding Philistine. Um, so we hope you all enjoy, inshallah ta'ala, the discussion tonight. You're all more than welcome to get involved. This is the whole point of it, to get involved, inshallah. We want to hear from all of you and we'll be respecting one another. So without further ado, um, our panel of speakers tonight, we have uh, with us tonight, we have Sheikh uh, Elias Kermani, who is going to be, inshallah, uh, uh, part of the panel our uh, teacher, inshallah, who is an activist, who is uh, an imam, a, a speaker, has been engaging with the Muslim community in regards to the issues that are affecting the youth and also mental health. 
and uh, you know many many other issues. He's currently, I believe, in Sweden at the moment. Allah bless him and his work. We have Ustad Omar Hajjaj, who is also a well, one of the students of knowledge and also a activist. He is a youth worker. He is one of the founders of Yasin Youth Academy. Subhanallah, that deals with helping the Muslim youth. Inshallah, and has many different programs on them. And also we have uh, Sheikh Shadid Muhammad, who will be joining us soon, connecting in from the US of A, who is the Imam of the Masjid ar rawda in Delaware, who inshallah, who will be joining us soon to come, inshallah ta'ala. The topic at hand, subhanAllah, as we've said, is Muslims and anti-Islamic propagation. And we've chosen this as the first topic because it's a challenge, subhanAllah. And the question at hand is tonight, the first major question is, do Muslims overreact to anti-Islamic propaganda? As we've seen in Europe uh, regarding the issues uh, and the events that have taken uh, in Sweden, in Malmo, in July 2023, the clashes in Malmo from individuals like Salwan Momika, who gathered together roughly about 200 people in a rally and desecrated the Quran, burnt the Quran, and has spurred out a lot of anti Islamic rhetoric. And the retaliation of the Muslims have been uh, that of riots that uh, people were arrested, 10 detained, and other similar events like this in um, Norway and Quran burning uh, from individuals like Lars Thorson, whose car was uh, damaged uh, by anti-protesters. Uh, five or more people were injured after the rally. Go All the way going back to other events, since even before the incident in Paris, the 2015 Charlie Hebdo incident. So without further ado, the question at hand in general, I'm going to invite uh, Ustad, first of all, Ustad Alias Karmani on stage, just to give us a, 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 a quick um, uh, advice. Uh, Ustad Ilyas, can you hear me? Are you in the room? I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me all well? We can hear you well, alhamdulillah. Okay, so, alhamdulillah. Ustad, the, the question at hand, inshallah, yep. is okay. do Muslims overreact to anti-Islamic <laughs> propaganda? Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah. Assalatu wassalam ala rasulillah. A'udhu billahi minna shaytan rajim Wa la tahinu wa la tahzanu wa antumu al-a'launa in kuntum mu'minin. So Allah says in the Quran, do not fear, do not grieve. You will achieve ascendance in kuntum mu'minin if you are a believer. Now this verse is very pertinent to the to the subject that we are exploring, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa as well, sorry. We're, we are exploring tonight. Because what it indicates is this, that the secure believer, Secure in their faith, secure in their outlook, in their mindset, in their vision, in their in their des final destination, inshallah, has neither inferiority complex nor identity conflict. Walks upon the earth, as Allah says in Surah Furqan, you know, yamshuna Walk upon the worshippers of the merciful, walk upon the earth with hauna, a tranquility, this sense of being totally at peace, you know, and when it says, you know, uh, and when the jahil addresses them, uh, they say salam and they move upon their way. And there's another very important verse related to this whole subject as well. Allah says, The good deed and the evil deed are not equivalent. So repel evil with that, which is good. Now, uh, brothers, uh, Sami, obviously my core psychologist for the last 30 years. And emotional control is a very, very critical role that we need to have, that we need to keep our emotions in check. And that's what Allah says, wal kathimin al ghayt wal afin an nas. You know, control your emotions, your anger, and then forgive the people. So you you said, I'm in Malmo at the moment. I work here. I actually am part of one of the main NGOs here, 
which work with works with young people. So all of the Quran demonstrations, I've been there. We've been the ones doing the conflict resolution work at all of the Quran burnings for the last two years, up and down, actually, in Malmo. I've been at them myself. I've seen the events themselves. And I actually think that goes out to the community of how we deal with provocation based on the, the prophetic model. But this is the interesting thing. I've put all of the guidance. How about the Prophet, Ali Salatu Wasalam, the Uswatun Hasna, the perfect example for us, the perfected human being, Khairul Bariya, Ali Salatu Wasalam, who dealt with provocation we cannot imagine, who dealt with being abused and tortured, having his companions killed, daily onslaught of the Quraysh and their propaganda machine against the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. They were few in number. Daily uh, demonization, boycott, harm and injury. The Prophet Ali Salatu Sallam going to Taif, being humiliated uh, and stoned and his body being lacerated. So the Prophet Ali Salatu Sallam called Kahin, called Sha'ir, called Majnoon, abused. Like I said, his companions killed in front of his eyes. We cannot imagine, you know, and this is what I'm saying. When people say Islamophobia today, I say, what? I really, you know, I, I, I'm outraged over how someone, some of our brothers and sisters are absolute snowflakes. You know, if I tell the people I'm not, and I don't intend to do this, the amount of times I've been detained by the police, okay, the number of times I've had uh, been cancelled by the, the right-wing media, the number of times, and I'm telling you, you know, I don't complain. And I say, Alhamdulillah, because when I'm stopped by the police, and last time it happened in the airport, and I had a section Schedule 7 stop, okay, I said, Alhamdulillah, they're stopping me because my name's Muhammad Alias, because I'm a Muslim, okay? And I had no insecurity about it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm very astute at dealing with these stops now, you know? Yeah, I find some of our younger brothers and sisters crying their eyes out. Oh, this has happened to me. This has happened. Allah must have really. Yeah, we have all our, what's going on on the global level. Yeah. The point I'm saying here is this, that, you know, if you're being persecuted and if you're having hardships and if you're having difficulties, but your identity is robust, you know your existential purpose, you know why you're on this earth and you're following the example of the best. This is something which is insignificant. And I look, the media representation of Muslims Actually, I, before you know, I was involved obviously in the Muslim space. I was an anti-racist uh, campaigner from the eighties onwards. I'm in my fifties, late fifties. So you know, I was senior race equality officer for the Commission for Racial Equality. I was the head of race equality for the Welsh Assembly Government. I was a senior uh, researcher in race at the Race and Public Policy Research Unit at Leeds and Bradford University. I used to teach the course on race and racism and historical representations of race. So this is a field that you know we know well. It's not new. If you read Edward Said, Said's book on Orientalism, what we have Islamophobia, and just to give you an idea, in 1995, I was actually part of the uh, the the Ronimi Trust inquiry, the first inquiry into racism, uh, into Islamophobia, which came up with the definition. So I was actually part of that. I actually also wrote, when I was a politician and an elected member in Bradford Council, I actually wrote the whole motion on Islamophobia, and that was later adopted by the all parliamentary group on Islamophobia. So they've actually used my reference work on, on Islamophobia and what anti-Muslim sentiment is. So it's a field that I know very, very well. And I don't trivialize it. Yes, there is Muslim discrimination that goes on and there is anti-Muslim media and it's an onslaught and social media has been a massive game changer in terms of just kind of proliferating this on a global level and the level of hate speech and the level of demonization that takes place is just phenomenal. And it has an impact on people's mental health. It traumatizes them. And I saw this at the demonstrations when young people in particular, they see the Quran being burned. And the emotions overwhelm them so much that they charge the police, they get arrested, and it's just, you know, causes detriment. But then the same youth I see, on the one hand, they're shouting, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and the next moment they're around the corner smoking weed and going clubbing and going to shisha bars. Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of like a strange kind of situation. It is what it is. But my core point is this, that, you know what, post 9-11 and the war on terror generation who had daily demonization of, in the media and misrepresentation, you know, as Noam Chomsky said, everything is an opportunity to, for you to get your point across. So we are always in the media and we are always high profile and we have not stopped being high profile for 1,400 years, alhamdulillah, which means that Islam is always relevant. And is whenever we have a, 
an anti-Muslim message, it is an ideal opportunity for us to articulate the beauty of Islam, to articulate the true message of Islam. But the challenge is this, unfortunately, even with the current complex situation in Gaza, and I always say to people, try solve this complex geopolitical situation in the most uh, volatile geopolitical region in the world with the most significant natural resources in the world, which has a global impact, yeah. And people who can't even have no concept of complexity or sophistication or have spent any time doing any kind of strategic analysis, yeah, are just going around emotionally outpouring. And this does not help the Palestinian cause or any cause. Okay, we need intelligence and we need people who are well thought and we need people who are robust in their thinking and we need people to go and take the the theological principles that we have and contextualize them within our environment. So, as I told you, I wrote the guidance here in Malmo, okay, on how we as Muslims should deal with provocation of Quran burners and things like this and how the Prophet was known. And we gave this guidance to our community. Did they follow it? Of course they didn't follow it. Instead, they just emotionally reacted. They left their principles behind. So my final point is this. Yeah, the, my point, my core point is this. There have always been for 1,400 years, post the Prophet ﷺ, in his time as well, that the opposing powers always use their propaganda machines. It's not something new that we're going through at the moment. It's always been there. They use their propaganda machines to demonize Islam and the Muslims. Okay? Whether it was the Byzantine Empire, whether it was subsequent empires thereafter, it wasn't new. The only difference was that where we had people of knowledge, people of, of gravitas, people of thinking, people of ideas who robustly, okay, you know, refuted these ideas and made Islam crystal clear. And this is my approach all the time. Whenever we go around saying, oh, you know, we can't condemn this, we can't. I said, I'm not here to condemn. I'm here to make Islam clear from distortions, from lies, from misrepresentations. Whenever we are in the media, it gives us an opportunity to challenge, even with the, whether it's on the macro level or at the micro level, the person next door to you. When there's an issue in the media, it's an opportunity for you to have a conversation with everyone around and say, look, people are saying this about Islam. People are saying this about this and that. This is what Islam actually teaches. That's it. And we create influence and change through that. There's always been this binary representation of Muslims for 1,400 years. Yeah, either they demonize us, or that they try to. You can almost, like I said, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of make us sugarcoat us. We have on the one find one hand we have Islamophobia, on the other hand we have Islamophilia, which is okay. You get these people saying, "Let's sugarcoat Islam and make it look really beautiful and beautiful." And I say, "No, we follow Wasidiya." I'm not here in demonizing. I'm not here in, in sugarcoating. I'm here in truth. I'm here in a robust argument where we present truth to people and say, this is, and we say it with fakhr. Like I said, wala tahinu, wala tahzanu, wa antum wala I do not fear, I do not believe, I do not have an inferiority complex. I'm not, this is Islam. Take it or leave it. End of. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. No problem. Jazakallah khair, uh, Sheikh, for that. But just uh, on the point, um, Regarding, you said obviously that generally Muslims don't follow the guidance when it comes to their our reaction to certain uh, uh, propagate anti-Islamic propagation. But yeah. having said that, Sheikh, then is it an issue that Muslims do not know how to channel their emotions? So would that be would that be part of the problem? So, so one, there so is one a the, reaction to that. Yeah, so, so one of the things we say here in Malmo to the youngsters is that if you cannot emotionally control yourself in front of this publication of the Quran being burnt, do not come. Okay. But it just becomes, like I said, you know, but people, again, they don't listen to us. And then, you know, they're already, look, if you know what's going on in Malmo at the moment, we have the highest violence in the whole of Europe. There has been 45 bombs in the last year, not just in Malmo, across Sweden. There have been 250 plus people killed as a result of gang violence. So kids, the same week we had the Quran burning, there were two bomb explosions where two gangs were going at each other. This is happening on the kids. So they've been traumatized by the violence on the streets, gang violence. Then they see the police coming, cordoning off an area, a person coming and, and obviously violating that which is sacred. Okay. And, and, and it's the same thing. If you can't con control the emotions, then that's what you're exactly doing. You are having an emotional reaction. It's not going to hire executive function. Now, the Prophet, I want everyone to realize this is not just a model around excellence behavior. This is about psychology and emotional control. At Ta'if, the Prophet, went through such, a, a, such suffering on that day. 
If you and I had gone through a fraction of that suffering, we would emotionally react with anger and want retribution. The Prophet ﷺ is asked by Jibra'il Islam that the angel of the mountain will destroy these people. And he replies by saying, forgive my people, they don't know what they do. Perhaps will come from them a people who will worship Allah. That is called an amazing level of emotional control. As Allah says, well, 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 yeah? control your angers and then forgive the people. Now, this is part of the problem that, you know, our youngsters just do not have the emotional resilience and the emotional control to deal with this. And as a result of that, they're just emotionally reacting. And so therefore, the principles go completely out of the window. There's another story I want to say that uh, because Sweden has a law around freedom of expression, it has a very th high threshold. It lets people do whatever they want. Yeah. OK. Uh, and I've been recently having conversations with the MPs this week in Sweden saying that what you're done doing is deeply traumatizing young people yeah and so this is having a detrimental effect and hopefully this will have an impact but there was an also another incident uh, uh sami where yeah a, mu a muslim said that he was going to burn the torah in front of the jewish embassy in stockholm did you hear about this um i haven't heard of that one no no okay so and, and sweden gave this muslim brother the right to burn the torah in front of the jewish embassy yeah and it made news in sweden Netanyahu and the Israeli government phoned up in uh, Sweden and said, the Swedish government said, if you allow this to do that, we are going to do this, we're going to do that. So they were not happy with it. But they said, no, we don't care. We're going to have to allow him because if we allow people to do this, we have to allow him to do this as well. So he then went in front of the Jewish embassy. He read the Torah. He got his uh, lighter ready to burn the Torah. And he's about to burn the Torah. And then the media all there looking at him. And then he stops and he says, we don't do this. Okay, now that's a good one. Yeah, that's how you deal with this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we show idf ahsan. Okay, that we show excellence and al ihsan in the state of provocation. So you know, even what's going on at the moment, there, you know, unfortunately, we have the leadership crisis when it comes to these matters because we need level heads. An yeah. intelligent and intelligent response. And my final point is that you know we do not have enough think tanks whereby, even in our at the masajid level. You know, people of knowledge, people where, who have the, the theological principles and the Sharia principles come with the people who understand Waqia and are aware of the current events. Yeah, we sit down and we formulate papers, you know, on response to the issues that are taking place at the moment. And we formulate the guidance and we give it to our communities. OK, I, when, I, when I was I, when I, one of my jobs was I used to be a speech writer for the social justice minister here in the, in the UK. I used to write all of her speeches for her. And her lines to take because we used to look at all of the issues and write these speeches and give them the, you know, so at a Moscow level, we need to do this. Yeah. So therefore, what, what's happening is that robust guidance is going out to our communities of how to deal with these kind of contemporary issues and challenges and giving them guidance. Look, if you can't do it, then don't come. Um, just to stop you there, Shay, because I'm going to bring uh, Sheikh yeah, uh, Umar Al-Hajjaj in as well, inshallah. Uh, uh -huh. Sheikh Umar, can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. I'll just... Try and invite him in now. Salam alaikum, Sheikh Omar. Can you hear me, inshallah? Salam alaikum. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Just, just on the topic, Sheikh, as we were saying about oh. sort of uh, moving forward, and Sheikh was alluding to the fact that there's some Muslims that if they can't, if they don't have the emotional capability to sort of, uh, you know, endure what's yeah. You know what they see and what they hear. How do we move forward with that? I mean, let's take for example, like the protests that, whether it be mm. the desecration of the Quran, the issues of Palestine. What is yeah. uh, the way to move forward? And do we is is there much uh, benefit in going to protests and and voicing the Muslim um, you know issues to the governments and the embassies out there? Um, uh, I personally do encourage people, especially young people, to attend protests and demonstrations if it's for for Palestine, if it's for, um, you know, expressing your views against people who are, you know, ignorant fools who are burning our holy Quran, uh, because it's important that we send a message. Um, it's important that our voices are heard. Um, so in particular, the Palestine case recently, um, you know, our brothers and sisters who are in Palestine, who are, you know, suffering from these attacks, from these bombs, when they see, um, you know, no hope in the world leaders, but they see images and pictures of their brothers and sisters all the way in the UK, 
all the way in Europe, all the way in America, um, in their neighboring countries, Jordan, Syria. It kind of gives um, a message that we did not forget them, you know, even if the, those in charge with responsibilities um, have forgotten them, but the, the people, the Ummah, have not forgotten them. So I do encourage people to attend um, protests, to speak the truth, to educate people, to raise awareness about the oppression that's happening. However, uh, with the following guidelines, uh, we need to follow certain guidelines. Uh, number one is to use Islamic manners. So do not go with the intentions of, of causing, you know, mayhem or having fights with, you know, police officers. Um, you know, it's it's good to see anger. You know, it's good to see young people angry about what's happening. Um, it's good that there's emotions there because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, uh, مَنْ لَمْ يَحْتَمْ بِأَمْرِ الْمُسْلِمِ Whoever is not concerned or does not care, does not react to the affairs of the Muslims, then he is not one of us. The hadith is da'if, but the, the meaning is sahih. Um, so it's, it's important to see anger and to see a reaction. However, a good Muslim is someone who knows how to manage his emotions and anger properly. So he knows when to use it, when not to use it. The Prophet ﷺ used to get angry as well. He used to raise his voice. He used to have, he used to get, um, you know, red in his cheeks for the haqq and from the best forms of, of jihad. Striving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to say kalimat, kalimat haqq. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said in another narration that anger is not permitted except uh, except if it's speaking the haqq, if, if it's speaking the truth. So that's number one, using Islamic manners, yeah. knowing how to you know use your emotions and anger. Number two, it's also an opportunity for da'wah all the time, uh, you know, even during war, during hardship, during ease, the Muslim should use opportunities for da'wah. Uh, now. If I just stop you there, uh, Sheikh Omar, because uh, obviously mm. I definitely, obviously I'm, I'm being impartial, but you say yeah. that and from obviously time and time again, we see that um, it's a case where usually there's a lot of harm in like protests like this. There's people that, you know, uh, do not follow the guidelines. So yeah. could, I mean, people could argue against and say, well, you know, the, the the harms outweigh the good in these t- yeah. type of protests. So should they just be left? What what's your response to like people that you know? Um... Yeah. So 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 I'll I'll just I have two responses, but I'll just finish with with the recommended guidelines. Bismillah. Uh, which yeah. So number one, we said Islamic manners. Number two opportunity for da'wah, so forbid the evil, enjoy the good, give sincere nasiha to our brothers and sisters, give uh, da'wah to non-Muslims who, who were there. Uh, the third, which touches upon your point, is that these protests and demonstrations, they will always have different types of people. Um, so we need to use wisdom in our approach and how to send the message. So not everyone's going to be practicing in these protests, not everyone's going to be following guidelines, like you said, but they're still part of the ummah. Uh, that's from the Muslimin and from the non-Muslims. It's an opportunity to 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 have a platform, have a voice, and and send message. The Prophet Sallallahu will use these opportunities, um, you know, a, a platform or the Sahaba radiAllahu Taala anhum to to send messages. Uh, number four, free mixing, of course, free mixing with the opposite gender. Uh, you know, avoiding that and lowering the gaze and stuff. That's that's important in protest. And even I don't recommend sisters. Uh, to participate in protests, but if they are, to to do it, you know, um, with within their own groups and to avoid the crowds, um, you know, to, to to avoid the crowds and to avoid raising their voices, um, and then obviously the music and the dancing that sometimes we see in in the Palestinian protests. Uh, I'm Palestinian myself, so you know they they get emotional, uh, Palestinians, and you will find them in the end doing the debka and stuff. I. I I advise against that. That's not going to help liberate Palestine, of course. So yes, attend the protests within these guidelines. And it's similar to going to the marketplaces. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, go to the marketplaces, but these are the guidelines. It's what he said to the to the youth, that you don't stand in people's way, you don't create congestion, you lower your gaze. Uh, you know, there's dhikrillah, the wow. protest and the aswaq, they are not like places to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perhaps. 
uh, because uh, in particular the marketplaces we're not remembering Allah, we're indulging in dunya, you know, we're buying and selling. Uh, however, if you're in the protest and you're doing dhikr and you're doing your salah and you're, you know, raising your voice, you're going with that intention, then it's, it's difficult to say don't go. And just lastly, uh, yeah, Sami. No, no, go for it, go for it. Sorry. Some people say, you know, what's the protest going to do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, which, which was probably my yeah. next question. Yeah, go. No, no, I agree. And it's the same. What's signing a petition going to do? What's boycotting Israeli products going to do? What's sharing an article on social media going to do? What's uh, a tweet going to do? What's making a dua going to do? What's donating £10 going to do? This is not the right thinking for a Muslim. Because the Prophet Sallallahu he said, do not look down on a small deed. All of the above that I mentioned might seem like it won't achieve much if it was done alone. But if every single person uh, was to do one thing, collectively, there will be a big part to play. If we are more united and hopeful, uh, we will be able to, to, to achieve. So if every person plays a part, the Prophet said, each one of you, each one of you will be guided to what he's best for. Okay, Some people might be good at writing, some people might be good at different methods. But if collectively as an ummah, we, we're all doing something, even if this something is little, then you will see the impact. It's a very um, shallow mindset to, to, to think, okay, what's this going to do? I'm not going to do it. If we're going to look at every single action in, in this simplistic individual way, then we might as well not do so many things that we usually do in, in, in our life, you know. So everything is gradual, everything is small, but collectively, you know, as the as the Arab saying says, that the mountain, the strong, large mountain is made of small pebbles. Yes. So we don't look at the pebbles, we look at the collective efforts, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, jazakallah khair. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, this evening, Sheikh Omar. I know you was, uh, you've you been busy. Uh, so we really appreciate your feedback. Uh, Allah bless you. Uh, continue your good works, inshallah ta'ala. Um, just uh, brothers and sisters who are in the room, remember that you can uh, get involved at any time. You can raise your hand if you have anything to contribute to the discussion. Inshallah, you're more than welcome. If you are more comfortable with just posting your question in the chat, you can do so as well. Remember, this is an open platform for everybody to voice uh, their thoughts and their feelings. Inshallah, we have uh, a panel of uh, shayukh and, and teachers tonight as well that you can pose your questions uh, two, I see that uh, a Sheikh Shadid Muhammad is also in the room uh, listening in. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. MashaAllah. Uh, if you are uh, available to give us a few words, inshallah, when you are free, just please uh, let us know, inshallah, and then we can obviously invite you onto the stage. Um, just to go back then, uh, Sheikh Alia, so uh, that which uh, Sheikh Omar uh, was talking in regards to the protest, do you share those same sentiments? Do you think that there is definitely a a bigger benefit of doing so or do you feel that there are more uh, productive ways to get involved Ustad Elias are you still with us inshallah not a problem I think uh, Sheikh is on mute inshallah does anyone uh, have any thoughts any uh, feelings in regards to the question at hand tonight inshallah is do Muslims overreact to anti-Islamic uh, propaganda I think that's uh, Hussein is that your hand up inshallah Assalamu alaikum is uh, Hussein there? Assalamu alaikum. No, subhanAllah. So, uh, Jazakallah khair for uh, coming into the room, everybody. SubhanAllah, we are discussing this issue in regards to the reaction of uh, Muslims with uh, regards to the anti Islamic media. And obviously, currently, we see the issues regarding the people in. Uh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sheikh Hussein. How are you doing tonight? MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan. I'm good, Ustad Sami. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan for um, arranging this uh, very important discussion today. MashaAllah. And jazakallah khairan to the shaykh. MashaAllah. We have spoken, Sheikh Elias, Sheikh Omar. 
Tabarakallah. Um, I want to just contribute as well, inshallah. Uh, myself, you know, start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. I'd like to, uh, subhanallah wa ba'd, I'd like to say that uh, me, myself, uh, I mean, I've been working quite closely with media organizations, very large media organizations, including the BBC, including, uh, you know, Sky, including uh, Virgin Media. So the major um, organizations in the country, in the United Kingdom, subhanAllah. Um, and I think as Muslims, uh, we definitely need to get a better understanding of, you know, how uh, uh, Muslims are portrayed in the media. I think this is quite critical for us. And mashallah, the speakers so far have mentioned... Um, uh, very eloquently, mashallah, how the Muslims need to have an understanding of this. Um, and, you know, if we if we focus a bit more closer into it, I'm sure everybody who is on uh, the call tonight will appreciate that there are certain experiences that we've all had, whether it's the newspapers we read, whether it's the television that we watch, subhanAllah, that we have seen these certain... Um, um, trends uh, uh, manifest themselves, uh, you know, and it's important to just call them out. I mean, how how can the media, you know, physically be be negative or be anti-Islamic? Um, and it's quite important for us all to understand the different ways in which this manifests itself. Uh, I mean, one of them, uh, the first ones, which I'm sure everybody has come across, is negative stereotypes within the media. Uh, when we have watched, you know, whether it's a news report or whether it's a comedy on television, you know, or some sort of entertainment, um, often over the years we have seen it, uh, you know, ma such things manifest themselves. And you, and you can see that, you know, through these media sources, people, uh, the masses, are essentially being programmed. They're being taught how to think. I mean, many of us, subhanAllah, who are probably quite young in the 80s, and maybe you watch the movie uh, Back to the Future, subhanAllah. When we were younger, we watched these movies, yeah? And subhanAllah, it was probably one of the first times for many of us to see, like, a, 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 an Arab person, uh, you know, North African person, portrayed as a terrorist. And we know that in the, in, in the news at the time, there was a lot of anti uh, Libyan, uh, you know, uh, sentiment being pushed through the media outlets, a lot of tensions against Libya. And then in, in, in Back to the Future, you see it when he says, uh, you know, run, the Libyans are coming. And they portray the Libyans as these crazy Arab terrorists that want to blow up the professor, you know. And so this is just a stark example. And I'm sure, you know, multitudes of them can be mentioned, but an example of negative stereotypes. Yes, that, that are portrayed for Muslims. Another one is selective coverage. I mean, another example, which we're seeing in the news today. I mean, you can, I, I think everybody can witness, even like famous people are coming out and speaking out against it. Many are speaking like for the, uh, the side of Israel. But you can see that there's a very one-sided uh, coverage of, uh, you know, the news and what's unfolding in the Middle East, in Palestine yeah. at the moment. And this is an example of selective coverage. So, you know, you can see that the media is very selective about the narrative that it pushes, very selective about, you know, the kind of arguments that they put forward to the people that they invite onto the television. Yeah. So this is another example. Um, you yeah. know, can, can, I, I can I ask then, yeah. Hussain, just on that topic then, <laughs> You know, where there is, as you said, some form of a bias, uh, you know, could, could, would you say that as well, the Muslims are guilty of that themselves? You know, whenever there is a uh, Muslims doing wrong, whether that is in retaliation as worse or a reaction which is, you know, far greater than the good, that we are ignoring the wrongdoings of our own selves as well. I think if, uh, if, people were to do fair and unbiased um, research into many of the things that are reported in media, they will find that uh, in actual fact, uh, it, is, it, it, it is a bias that does not 
represent the true story. Yeah. They will find that, in actual fact, a lot of details uh, that are representative of the other side of the story are actually not mentioned. And sometimes, you know, through the... Like, someone, can I just come in quickly here? Said, can I come in? Coverage. Yeah, go, go for it, son. Yes, yeah. yeah. Hussain, Jazakallah khair, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, for that. Yeah. But you know what? Whenever I have this conversation with people, I'm surprised that people think that the media is biased. Okay, you know, of course the media is biased, and of course they have an ideological perspective. And we live, obviously, in the West, and you know there is no free media, and it's not even what we call unconscious. People used to call it unconscious bias. It's not unconscious. It's completely conscious. It's concerted. They have an agenda, and and you know that's the reality of the matter. But there's a massive game changer. Yeah, and the game the game changer now is two things. Okay, on a strategic level, okay. is that social the proliferation of social media has really, as you know, completely undermined the mainstream media, and they are apps. Why I find that the current uh, media representation of the uh, you know the the conflict at the moment, yeah, is so one sided, is because they realise now that they are in an echo chamber, that they're only appealing to their own base. I remember back in 1982, you know, Hussein, you and I are of this uh, generation of Sabra. You remember the Sabra and Chitila mass massacres in 1982 in, in yes, Beirut, yes, yeah? Yes. If you look at the way that the media represented that in 1982, it's nowhere near. They saw quite clearly what the uh, uh, moral morality and what the side of morality was in relation to that. From 82 up until now, all we've had is a subsequent, like I said, absolute bias one-sided perspective and it's been more so the current conflict it's horrendous what they're doing and it's indicative of the fact that they have completely lost their audiences and everyone is listening to alternative media and also the fact that the global south which actually constitutes uh you know 60 70 percent of the world's population remember the global south really we're talking about five billion people compared to the two billion people in the global north the global slouch, their whole media is pro-Palestine. It gives a completely different perspective yeah. compared to the global. So, so, the, so there is actually a shift in the axis. Final point I want to make is to Sheikh Omar as well. He makes excellent points, Barakallah. Yeah? What I would just say uh, in addition to what Sheikh Omar has said is this, that when we go on demonstrations or when we are involved in any kind of activism, it has to be strategic we have to have clear objectives we analyze the environment we have to realize these are the things that we're trying to achieve through this process we have an organization and discipline and a structure there has to be an emir there has to be control people have to be under orders and that you know this is how we engage in this particular process it cannot be something which is just ad hoc and something which is unstructured i did a talk with uh uh what is it uh, uh malcolm x's daughter yeah Okay, uh, Malika Shabazz, that's his youngest daughter. I did a lecture with her many years ago after the Ferguson uh, attacks, yeah, in the US. Okay. And there was a young brother who was a bit of a hothead and he was screaming and shouting, we got to do this, we got to do that, we got to do this, we got to do any means necessary. And she was outraged. She said, how dare you take my dad's words like that? Okay. And she said that no, her father's approach was strategic disciplined people were under orders as the emir and she gave an amazing story i haven't got time to go through it today where you know the the, the muslims on mass went on the demonstration against the police and they had so much discipline and control that they could have torn the place to pieces yeah they were under such discipline under the control of uh, malik al shabazz yeah, that they maintained that and then they got their objectives achieved so that's my concern about this We've got to have objectives. We've got to have a clear strategic purpose in what we're doing, clear messaging, clear roles, responsibilities, uh, under a leadership, and all of that kind of stuff, yeah, whether, it, you know, uh, at a semi-formal or formal level. But unfortunately, we are so ad hoc and unstructured at many of our times. MashaAllah. Subhanallah, yes, absolutely. And, I, and I, I would totally agree with that. And one of the reasons why I was calling out, you know, the examples of uh, the way that media manifests itself against the Muslims is because if we break down things like the negative stereotypes, the selective coverage, the misrepresentation of Muslims in the media, 
you know, the, the way that headlines are used and terminology is used. I think this young generation of Muslims, the Shabab, mashallah, who are aware, who are in touch with the way society uh, works and moves, subhanAllah, and indeed the social media movement, this needs certain visionaries to come forward and to start redressing that balance. So if we see that there is selective coverage, we need, we need people who are Muslim journalists to come and provide the other side of the story in a professional way, subhanAllah, in a way that is palatable to the masses, in a way that is fully understood. Negative stereotypes need to be addressed, subhanAllah, like the likes of the people that you talked about. I mean, uh, people like Malcolm X, one of, one of the great examples of Malcolm X's narrative and the way that he spoke to the people that shifted uh, you know, the thinking, or even got those people who were in, like, racist thought patterns uh, and made them uneasy is because he brought out, uh, you know, the negative stereotypes that were being uh, normalized within society, and he, and, he, and he highlighted the effect that they were having on the black people and put it on, in people's faces. I mean, an example of Malcolm X's interviews when he was in mainstream media and he puts the interviewer on the spot you know, with regards to what the black people were going through in America and asks him counter questions, uh, you know, um, is, is, is an excellent example of like redressing that balance, speaking up for ourselves, having a backbone, subhanAllah, and representing ourselves in the media, which, you know, in, in the period of time that Sheikh Elias has said that we've been growing up has been sorely missed, subhanAllah. So, yes. yeah. okay. Excellent point. Uh, I'm just going to see if we have a uh, connection with Sheikh Shadid. If you are there, inshallah. Sheikh, Sheikh Shadid, are you with us, inshallah, Ta'ala? Uh, your mic is on mute, inshallah. If you are, then just please do uh, let us know. I think but, you have to unmute from the yeah. bottom right. Uh, there's, 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 there's a if, mic if you are with there, us, there. Sheikh. Yeah. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Yes, well, I'm figuring it out. <laughs> well, Sheikh. Uh, I know uh, it's it's evening time for us, Sheikh. I think it's uh, about four five p.m. there in uh, in the states, inshallah Taala. Um, yes, yes. But Sheikh, I, I, you may be listening into uh, the discussion, but I've got a, a question for you, Sheikh, regarding the reaction of Muslims and and something I was thinking about today is how how do we measure the reaction to when it can can be considered an overreaction so things that happen regarding the anti-islamic rhetoric that's coming out how do we measure our reaction or how do we see whether we are overreacting or whether or not we are overreacting uh bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah I'm about to. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for inviting me on your, your, your platform, along those best. I think that's a great title, and I think you guys are going places with this. Uh, these type of discussions are definitely necessary because as I'm, I'm driving, and I'm doing my pickup from, you know, school and things like that, but I'm listening as I'm driving, and, you know, you guys brought up some really, really uh, good points, all valid points, alhamdulillah. So when you're talking about the uh, response uh, of the Muslims, I don't think that we're ever going to get a unified response uh, to any one particular, you know, situation. You know, even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, to certain situations and events that took place, you always had a variety, a wide range of reactions, responses. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't necessarily condemn you know, the Sahaba for their responses because these are just natural human responses. You follow me? Yeah. Natural responses. So we can't say to someone, this is uh, over, you're overreacting or you're, you know, um, yes, there are times when a person can do an action that might go against Islam. And as a result of the, the, the action or the reaction, then we address the behavior. But as far as, you know, how the person felt emotionally, I'll give you a few examples. One is uh, when Hatib ibn Abi Balta, anhu, sent a letter to his family in Mecca, you know, informing them that the Prophet ﷺ was, was coming to conquer Mecca. 
And, you know, he did it, you know, as he explained to the Prophet Wasallam, he didn't do it out of nifaq, he didn't do it out of hypocrisy, he didn't do it out of ridda, he didn't do it out of, you know, apostating from Islam or loving kufr. He, it was a simple, innocent mistake. But there was a, a range of responses to that. You know, Umar's response was, let me strike the head of that hypocrite. And the Prophet Wasallam's response was a little bit more understanding and accepting because as a leader, you know, there's more of a responsibility on him to be logical in that situation as opposed to, you know, the followers. You, you follow what I'm saying? Like what we're talking about, when we talk about the responses of the Muslims. We're talking about the general body of the Muslims. And it's really hard to get them to have one unified response to any particular reaction that's exactly that's, that's exactly. unrealistic you understand what i'm saying so and 100%. even when umar said you know Dani, he, he went so far as to call him a hypocrite to invalidate his shahada you understand what i'm saying like he invalidated this man's shahada called him a munafiq called him a hypocrite hmm. and the prophet وسلم, he didn't condemn umar for his response he just helped Umar to reframe, you know, reframe how he's looking at it. He said, no, Umar, Hafid participated in the battle of Badr, meaning he's not a hypocrite. And the appropriate response is not to strike his neck. And I, so, so, you know, while we would like the Muslims, you know, we have to make sure that we do not fall into political correctness when it comes to, you know, quantifying or qualifying the response of the Muslims. You know, we want a politically correct response. And that's not, that you're never going to get that. You know, we're, we're not looking for political correctness. If, if, if a group of Muslims get angry because people are burning the Quran, we applaud them for their anger. Obviously, there's healthy anger and unhealthy anger, right? But we applaud you because to not respond in a way that is, you know, angry and, you know, maybe a little bit exacerbated in the anger, to not respond like that would make us question your faith, would question your yeah. men, or what is wrong with you? And you're approaching this with such logic and, and, and such poise and, you know, demure. Like, yeah. no, that's not the, you know, we can't, you know, impose on Muslims to respond the way that makes the media, you know, view Muslims in a better light. We're human beings just like everybody else. However, there are times when the response needs to be redirected, you know, to say, hey, that that is not the appropriate reaction to this. You know, I, I get you're angry, you're upset, but that's not the way to handle that. You know, even when the Prophet Wasallam signed the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah, there were many of the Sahaba who took issue with that. You know, the Umar, here again, Umar, another one, you know, hot-headed at that time. You know, he, his response was even to challenge the Prophet Wasallam. He walked up to the Prophet and he said, aren't you the messenger of Allah? <laughs> Subhanallah. Like, Subhanallah. And, and, and the Prophet turns to Umar and he says, if he's that, he can check Umar. You know, do you have any doubt about that? Yeah. So, you know, you can see this kind of like back and forth between Umar and the Prophet Wasallam. It was a human reaction. Exactly. Umar's response yeah. to that was natural, like, how dare you sign this contract that puts us in a more inferior position? And you're the messenger of Allah. How dare you do this? He said, aren't you the messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said, do you have any doubt about that? He said, aren't we the ones that's on the truth and our enemies are the ones that are on falsehood? The Prophet said, of course. He said, then why do we have to always take an inferior position? And so he was clearly not you know, in agreement with the way that the Prophet ﷺ handled that. So his response, you know, the Prophet ﷺ never condemned him for his response. Yeah. He just simply said, Omar, I'm the messenger of Allah and I don't disobey my Lord. He's explaining to Omar that my reaction, my sign in this peace treaty is from a higher authority, you know, meaning from God, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not from me. This is from a higher authority. I'm the messenger of Allah, and I don't disobey my Lord. So that, that's the kind of, you know, I hope that, you know, it's, it's understood the point that I'm trying to drive home is that, you know, what you're seeing from Muslims is a natural response of anger and upset, you know, to be frustrated, to be, you know, uh, to feel, you know, like you're always being depicted in the worst possible light. And that's part and parcel our fault as Muslims. 
And the yeah. reason why I say that is because we have all of these platforms, social media platforms. We got podcasts. We got Instagram pages. We got TikTok pages. We got Twitter pages. We got all. And one of the beauties of social media is for people to be able to control their own narrative. Yeah. That, that, that is one of the beautiful things about social media is that you can create a multitude of platforms and control your own narrative. You know, so where where is where are the websites? I'm not saying they don't exist, but what I'm seeing now on Twitter, you know, I'm I'm seeing a lot of people. I'm not going to call any names out, but I see a lot of imams, both here in America as well as in the UK, you know, putting out, you know, uh, countering a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of false narratives that are being put out there about what's going on. And Gaza, which is the proper way to say that, people say Gaza, but the proper way to say that is Gaza. Yeah. And I know that that's a little that's a little unorthodox because we've been saying Gaza. Nonetheless, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there's there's a lot of false narratives that are being put out there by, of course, Jewish ran media or Jewish influenced or, or Zionist influenced media. Yeah. And, you know, they say, oh, they beheaded, you know, 25 kids or, and, and it was all lies. And, but what you see is a lot of imams countering those narratives with, you know, with the truth. Oh, that's false. That's a false narrative. That's a false statement. That's false news, fake news, blah, blah, blah. And alhamdulillah. And it's, it's a beautiful thing that they're doing that. Yeah, but this needed to be this needed to be done way before what we see happening now. Yeah, there needed to be websites. There needed to be podcasts, and I'm not saying that they they don't exist. You know, I'm I'm not necessarily emerged or immersed in that world. You know, obviously here in the states as an African American, we got we got tons of issues that we're dealing with. That's not to you know belittle or to yeah. you know sidestep what is going on in Palestine. I mean, that is the, of the highest priorities, obviously, to any Muslim. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we get, you know, so wrapped up in our own stuff that, you know, we don't necessarily prioritize that, is what I'm saying. So, Sheikh, do you think, and, do you think that uh, we're more, obviously, reactive than proactive just in general as an ummah? Yes, of course, I believe that. Why? Because there's, uh, as one of the brothers was mentioned, there's no structure to our ummah. There's no hierarchy. We don't follow orders. You know what I'm saying? Like every, it's like in the Muslim community, we're united, but we're disunited. We're united under La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but we are disunited in our own hawa, our own uh, ara, our own desires, our own opinions. We're we're all you know we're and that that goes with everything. Anytime you try to corner a Muslim to take a position on something, they'll always cite, you know, difference of opinion of scholars, blah, blah, blah. And that gives them the loophole, the leeway to just be independent in their own, you know, approach to Islam. And that's part of the problem. There's there's no uniform. There's no uniformity in our approach to our religion on any level. Well, I'm going to I'm going to bring I mean, in. Gonna, uh, yeah, go for it, Sheikh. Sorry. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, you you can go to Mecca and you'll find people praying with their hands on their chest, their hands by their side. You got the Shia who will pray with you and then right after you make Teslim, get up and pray again. It's just like, y'all all over the place, man. We're, you know what I mean? And then, of course, there's no no hierarchy in terms of leadership. This person is following this person. This person is following this person. This. Yeah. So, yeah, we're pretty much all over the place, man. So just just I want to say uh, bring in uh, the other panel uh, on this as well. Uh, Ustad Elias, if you're still there, are you still there with us? Um, so yeah, do I'm, you do I'm you good. like just going off what Sheikh uh, uh, Shadid said there? Do you yeah. think that we are our biggest barrier when it comes to our response? Uh, are we always more sort of um, preoccupied with? one another than just dealing with the issue look, 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 I, I think, you know, a fundamental principle in terms of positive change is taking personal responsibility. Allah even says it throughout the Quran, you know, in Allah la yukarima bi kumin hatta yuhiyunuma bi anfusim. Allah does not change the condition of people until they change themselves. And in particular, you know, this idea that we have to fix our own mess and we have to deal with the enemy within and we have to seek izza from Allah. Okay, you know, and and the reality of the matter is, you know, as Sheikh Shadid has mentioned, yeah, is that you're right. 
it's a bit of a mess, you know, and we have to sometimes take personal responsibility. We've got to clean our own house. Yeah. Sometimes we always externalize and we look at uh, external factors. It's called external locus of control. We blame the world and we have a victimhood mentality. And I, and I, I say, I'm never a victim. Like, how can I be a victim when I have the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have the example of the Prophet Ali I am never a victim. And whatever you've thrown at me, and, you know, myself and brothers, my brothers are saying, we've had a long time in activism, yeah, since the early 80s, yeah. You know, they've thrown everything at us. Honestly, look at it. They've thrown literally everything at us. Alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, we're still standing, yeah. And so they realize they have to take different strategies in doing it. So look, you know what you said about the proactivity and the reactivity? You're absolutely right. Yeah. Things happen, things happen, and then we jump around like headless chicken trying to deal with it. There's so much activism, and then it's gone. And then what it is, is that, you know, what we call about that strategic, really looking at the people of influence and control, the people who really make the multi-billion pound decisions that affect us, all of us. We're not even at these tables influencing that. And as someone who's been in the political process for, again, quite a long time, you know, that's really where most of the, the change takes place. But I really take this approach as having, like I said, over 40 years of, of being involved in activism, now reflecting and my life at this point and, and realizing that, you know, subhanAllah, as they, uh, as the statement goes, you know, when I'm young, I try to change the world. As I get old, I just want to change myself. Yeah. Even in the battle of Uhud, you know, when they had this masiba, they say, Kultum where did this come from? And Allah says, Kul huwa min indi and fusikum. Say it is from your own self. So I think alongside dealing with the real acute issues We've got to fix ourselves and we've got to fix our communities. I'm here in Malmo at the moment in Sweden. Obviously, I'm in the UK. I'm involved in my, my cities as well. We've really got to clean up our streets, you know, and we've got to deal with the crisis that we have on our doorsteps, in our families, in our homes, as well as dealing with the external factors. And, you know, when it comes to dealing with the issue with Palestine, okay, we as one jism obviously feel what's going on. And absolutely, we are outraged but it has to be channeled into a force of good that is based on creating benefit and avoiding harm. Uh, but on this, how can we deal with the, the challenge of Palestine when our part of the ummah is diseased as well? When we have cancers on our doorsteps, in that metaphorical sense. You know, as I said, where I am in now, the city I am in now, has a 40% Muslim population. Can you believe that? And Bradford is the other, I live in two cities. Both of them have a 40% Muslim population. Allahu Akbar. Wow. All the drug, all, you know, and Brother yeah. Sami, as you know, all the yeah. drug dealers, all the knife crime, all the bombings, all of the shootings, everything that's happening here. Last, just this week, one person was killed this week here in the city, Muslim on Muslim violence, yeah? So the reality, you look, look, we can externalize, we can be reactive, we can have a victimhood mentality, all of this stuff. We can then devote all of our efforts, efforts to dealing with problems overseas. And, but it comes at the expense of not dealing with our doorsteps. Yeah. You know, and fixing our, and you know that hadith, Adin on the sea, Hadin on the sea, it goes, Lillahi, Wali, uh, Lillahi, Wali Rasulihi, Wali Immatul Muslim, Wali Immatul Muslimin, Wali Am. So, you know, so the, it goes through a problem. We want to have help Amatul Nas, but that will only happen when our conduct is in accordance with what is pleasing to Allah, in accordance yes. with the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, والسلام, based on the guidance of the Immatul Muslimin, our leaders, the people of knowledge, the people of understanding, the people of wisdom, the people of experience, the people of gravitas the people of, you know, real uh, thought. And, and, and then we can start benefiting Amatul Nas. And, and, and I say this as I get hold, and I, I, by no means do I mean this in any kind of arrogant way. But, you know, the problem with one of the challenges that we have with the youth, with all of their fervor, and alhamdulillah, I've been there and I've been that hot-headed youth, and I know exactly yeah, what we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the youth have to be mentored by people of knowledge and wisdom and experience, you know. And uh, unfortunately, that's the other generational breakdown we have is that the, the, our elders are not giving back enough and are not mentoring and guiding the next generation so that they learn from our experiences. All we do is just seem to repeat the same pipe, title, same process. You know, as I get older, young people tell me that I'm a sellout now. <laughs> that, you know, yeah, what's, yeah. Happened to you? what's happened to you, uncle? You know, you're never there anymore. You're not part of it. I said, look, I've done my thing, man. <laughs> okay. I've yeah. done my stuff. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, you know, uh, but look, the key thing is, you know, we need, I, I, I say, as would, would I you say that is, Sir Shiv, without the, you know, because the, 
uh, without the experiences of the elders and the challenges are just seeming to get worse uh, as we go along and that's causing a you know a, a bigger issue um the do, problems do are getting bigger and the, the people have yeah. experience are not there yeah, I, I think so. There is a disconnect. There is a massive disconnect. And the nature of social media has made it such that it has put the Ruwaybida, the people who do not have, who are not grounded in knowledge and who are not grounded in experience and wisdom and complexity and understand the big picture, that they, they are shaping ideas of other people. And that's extremely problematic. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I'm not very supportive of social media in the general sense you know i, I feel that you know yeah i want well, i want to listen to people who like i said have the knowledge and experience and wisdom of yeah. life and the, that balance rather than to listen to people who themselves are quite emotionally you know charged and everything else and just on this final point you know yeah look the, the the yes we should have emotional responses when i go to the quran burnings here in malmo i see uh I get outraged. You know, come on, I get angry. Of course I do. Yeah. You know, uh, but you know, it has to be. We have to be clinical. I have to control it. I have to deal with it because if I lose it, then other people will lose it. And some of the youngsters who do lose it and then attack the police line and things like that, they're just in prison at them. They're in prison at the moment. That's it. It didn't achieve anything. Yeah. Okay. So you know, so the key thing is that in the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that yes, they were had different responses but the prophet والسلام, put them under orders and they followed those orders yes. that's the difference difference yeah and until we get to that level of discipline i have to say it's still going to be a bit chaotic absolutely uh we're just going to take a question shake uh from the uh chat we've got uh sister sophia uh she is asking she, well she's made a, a comment with a question she said my daughter leads her msa i'm guessing that's the equivalent to our Islamic societies here, I think, if sister wants to clarify, uh, and would like to know the best way to put out a message to speak against the slaughtering of the Palestinians. They're concerned about the school shutting them down if they show support. And I guess this is an issue in the UK as well. Uh, you know, once you speak out or defend people's rights, then you are seen as uh, anti-Semitic. So what is the best way of going about putting a healthy message out there, Sheikh? Uh, just, just quickly, and I have to leave after this. I have to leave yeah. after this. Okay. Uh, for the sister, that there is an organization in the UK, it's called MEND. It's put out a guidance already for young people in schools and how to engage in, in activism. There's also another organization, and, and, and uh, Brother Sami, if I share it with you, maybe you can share it with everyone yeah, else. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat, Sheikh, if you can. Yeah, uh, they, MEND they, they've all, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Men have put out a guidance for children in schools into how to engage in uh, activism within the law. Now, that's a UK guidance, but I'm sure that it can translate well to the US. Uh, there's also another uh, couple of organizations. I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, is it CARE in America have also probably put some guidance out? Because what's important is this, that we don't descend into racism and that we don't in descend into, you know, obviously things which will then... Uh, you know, divert away from the real cause that we have. So it's important that there are people who have, um, mashallah, we're much more organized now in this respect. There are these guidances that have gone out. So people should try to get these, give them, inshallah, to young people who are in need so that they have this framework, inshallah. So brothers and sisters and respected uh, uh, shuyuk as well, jazakallah khair for giving me the opportunity today. Brother Sami, alhamdulillah, always a pleasure to be in your company. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, guide, guide us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all Amen. the ability, inshallah, to only serve him and to seek izzah from him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his nusra and his protection and his and honor upon all of the Muslimin, inshallah. Amen. Amen. May Allah ta'ala relieve the difficulty of mustadifin, if he could him can, all those people are suffering and have hardship in Palestine and all over inshallah the world and across all those people who are in need may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overcome their difficulties I mean and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a source inshallah of goodness for all of humanity I mean we hope to uh, for you to enjoy uh, join us on Ameen. future episodes of Stad inshallah always a pleasure uh, uh, we've got some uh, more comments uh, coming through alhamdulillah if anyone wants to take the mic inshallah to share uh, something, then you're more than welcome to do so uh, as well. I just well. wanted to add to what Sheikh Aliyah said there. Yeah, go for it, Hussein. Yes. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khairan for the sisters' questions. And I think uh, the emphasis needs to lie in us focusing on the source of the problem. Philistine, when, when, when these incidents occur, 
and you know like the israeli aggression against the palestinian people there's actually a cycle with regards to it like if you look at the media and if you look at um you know the, the incidents that have occurred in the past 10 15 years you'll see that there's a cyclical thing that you know something happens then it kicks off and then they give the uh, uh, you know the palestinians a really really hard time and i think the key yeah. thing for us as 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 muslims obviously for us as uh, you know brothers or sisters to the uh, palestinian people is to understand the source of the problem you need to go back to the source of the problem and it's not about uh, you know attacking a people it's not about attacking a specific jewish people it's about understanding the source of the problem now this land that is in question prior to the establishment of the state of israel 1948 um, belonged uh, uh, to uh, the Palestinian people. I mean, it was not the state of Israel before 1948, and a sequence of events have occurred since then. So I think one of the key things for the sister or her daughter is to become familiar with this situation, uh, with, with the history of the region. Yeah. And from uh, becoming familiar with the history of the region, you will start to learn that there are... There are um, there are a number of key um, points that need to be understood. The first point is the occupation uh, and settlements. Now, Israel has continued to occupy the West Bank and East Jerusalem and the construction of Israeli settlements in these areas. This has sparked uh, problems. It has created conflict in the region between the two peoples and to the to the point where it seems like it's unresolvable and uh, this is not something you know that i am saying this is something that has been documented by the united nations security council in resolution 242 uh again you know these the, these uh, occupied occupied settlements have also been uh you know documented by united nations security council Resolution 338, uh, the International Court of Justice uh, uh, advisory opinion um, on, on the wall that has been created. So the settlements themselves are one of the main problems. The second point is the Gaza blockade. So the blockade of the Gaza Strip, which restricts the movement of the people, the goods, has uh, been... Uh, highlighted as one of the key points where humanitarian rights of the Gaza people have been imp impacted. This again has been documented uh, by, uh, you know, humanitarian uh, affairs organizations, um, and it's clearly documented. So for us as Muslims, we need to become aware of these, um, these excesses or these violations that have been done against the Palestinian people and to speak out against them, to become a voice for them. The third point is the use of force. Various military uh, operations uh, in the Israel-Palestinian conflict have raised concerns about the treatment towards civilians. Yeah. yeah? Uh, uh, and the, the disproportionate use of force by the Israeli army. I mean, the, you, we're talking about situations where children are throwing stones and army personnel holding machine guns, yeah, are shooting bullets in their direction. This is an absolute disproportional use of force. And it's clear, again, documented clearly by human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. We need to become familiar, familiar with these reports and to use these reports. And lastly... Um, the situation of the Palestinian refugees. Yeah. The, the plight of the Palestinian people and the refugees that have been forced out of their homes on land that they lived on and they owned. Uh, the issue of the Palestinian refugees and their right to return is a central concern in the problems that are flaring up. So it's, it's, yeah. it's really, uh, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it's about us getting familiar with the history with the detail that has occurred, with the violations that are being done against the Palestinian people and being a voice for them. Just as Sheikh said, 
not in a racist way, subhanAllah, not, not where we're calling out hatred, but in a way where we are standing up for the rights of an oppressed people, very much in the same vein as was done, you know, subhanAllah, in the 80s against apartheid and, and pre-80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, against apartheid South Africa. Because yes. Israel is a living apartheid state, yeah, in our midst that is fully operating now um, and we need to be a voice against it, subhanAllah. Allah bless you. Thank you for that, inshallah. Uh, very insightful. Um, just before we wrap up, inshallah, I'm not sure if that is uh, Sheikh Omar, if you are in the room, if you'd like to make some maybe closing comments, inshallah, before we wrap this up. I think is that is that Sheikh Omar in the room? I think Sheikh Omar may have left. Okay, uh, but yes, uh, that we, we're just going to wrap up uh, with episode uh, one: uh, the Muslims and anti-Islamic media. Inshallah, there was a lot said tonight. Subhanallah, we are going to try and keep these sessions uh, short and concise without obviously going uh, uh, over the time limit. Inshallah. Uh, our hearts, uh, our du'as, our prayers are with the people of Palestine. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to improve uh, their state. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease uh, their pain. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them Nasr, the uh, victory above them, underneath them, uh, from the right, from the left. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to fill them with uh, hope, with guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them martyrdom, those who have been uh, uh, martyred in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy upon their families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them uh, the highest ranks and the highest gardens of Al-Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to come closer in these times uh, of calamity, to unite together, our unite our hearts Upon clarity, understanding and knowledge, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his highest of names and his lofty of his attributes to return Al-Aqsa, return Palestine back to the people of Palestine. Jazakum Allah khair for everybody that has uh, joined and participated in tonight. If there's anyone that likes to make a comment, inshallah, you are more than welcome to do so. We apologize for any uh, technical difficulties uh, that may have happened as it is our first episode tonight. Uh, we are going to put out a, another episode, inshallah, next week. We'll let you know uh, as soon as that is confirmed. If you guys can... Uh, click the Allah Knows Best Clubhouse if you want to join us and become a member, inshallah, that you'll get the weekly updates. Bismillah, we'd love for that, uh, uh, for you to do that. And also, we are going to be putting these discussions online on YouTube. If you want to add our YouTube um, uh, channel, which is Allah Knows Best or the AKB pod, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallah fikum. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Ustad Hussein, thank you for your contribution tonight, inshallah. Sheikh uh, Elias, uh, Sheikh Shadid, and Sheikh Umar Hajjaj as well. And everybody that has participated tonight. Um, so until then, inshallah, we will see you on the next episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm -hmm.